and it was put on the floor by Republican leadership despite knowing that it was pulled from going through committee. We didn't have a chance to amend it. We didn't have a chance to discuss it, to debate it. We didn't have a hearing on it. It was jammed through to take advantage of this political moment while all of these horrific things are going around the country. Republican leadership wanted to score political points, so they moved through legislation without the kind of deliberation debate that is supposed to be carried out by the people in this chamber. Or distribution of anti-Semitic materials in some countries. See? That would mean that stating those truths, reading those truths, preaching those truths, handing out a tract with those truths, giving someone a book with those truths, giving someone a Bible is all anti-Semitic under this definition. As anti-Israel protests continue around the nation and they continue to turn into rioting and become more aggressive and more violent and incite hatred and incite violence and it continues to spread, government officials are thinking something must be done. Enforce the law? Huh, don't be silly. Let's pass a new law and make things look good and we'll pass an anti Christian law and call it an anti-Semitic law. Yes, that's indeed what happened. You need to be very concerned about the bill that passed the House and may very well pass the Senate. And so we're going to take a look at that today. We're going to dive into what that bill, uh, what, it, what it consists of. We're going to look at the definition of anti-Semitism. And then at the end, we're going to take a look at some reactions from members of Congress. Welcome to Truth Transforms. My name is Adam Markley. We're going to dive right in. We're going to take a look at this. We're going to uh, cover everything that I talked about here, and we're going to start with a little news clip to get you up to speed. So let's watch that now. Now, the campus protests have the support of many Jewish college students, but many others say that they feel intimidated and unsafe. Within the hour, the House voted overwhelmingly to pass a measure targeting anti-Semitism on campus. CBS 2's Tony Aiello spoke with two local sponsors of the bipartisan bill. We need to be able to define anti-Semitism. The bill sponsored by Republican Mike Lawler and Democrat Josh Gottheimer does just that. Their Anti-Semitism Awareness Act directs the U.S. Department of Education to use the definition developed by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance when enforcing federal anti-discrimination laws. Quote, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. It goes on to define examples of anti-Semitism. Some of the heated rhetoric on college campuses campuses would be included. When you hear from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, the reality is that is calling for the eradication of Jews and the state of Israel. All of our colleges have a responsibility to protect against hate and discrimination. And again, there's a difference between speech, which should be protected, and harassment and violence and intimidation um, uh, like, like a death threat. Colleges that fail to protect Jewish students could face civil rights enforcement. Critics, including Congressman Jerry Nadler, say the bill sweeps too broadly and would chill constitutionally protected free speech, including legitimate criticism of Israel. But others say speech has limits, and some of the rhetoric crosses the line into harassment. A lot of people come to me, but maybe they don't completely understand what they say. These pe those people are educated adults who are going to the best institutions in the world. They should know what they say. The bill still needs to pass the Senate and be signed by President Biden to become law. Tony Aiello, CBS 2 News. It's not clear right now if Speaker Johnson will bring other bills to a vote, including one to create a national anti-Semitism coordinator position in the White House. Yeah, a national anti-Semitism coordinator position. How bizarre is that? We need someone to oversee and, and decide what anti-Semitism is, which is based on a perception and much, much more, as you'll see. Now, before we get to that bill, let's just see. Does the Bible have anything to say about the Jew? Well, 
let's just type in the word Jew and see that, well, in the ESV, we get 258 results. Yes, the Bible has much to say about the Jew, obviously. Uh, and so, you know, the Bible could be considered anti-Semitic, like in John 10, 19. There was, again, a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Accusing Jesus of having a demon. That seems very anti-Semitic to me. Others said these are not uh, very anti-Semitic according to their definitions. I'm just saying. Others said these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So uh, we could also look at, actually, I think I've got something else highlighted here. Um, yeah, the Jews picked up stones, again, to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself equal to God. And you see how this could continue and continue, and I'll come back to that some more. But let's get to the bill. I know that you want to get to the bill here. Let's take a look at what this bill has to say. Uh, there's some interesting things that <laughs> is kind of like, we'll just start. I'll just start reading you some portions of it here. Okay, so to provide for the consideration of a definition of anti-Semitism, set forth by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance for the enforcement of federal anti-discrimination laws concerning education programs or activities and for other purposes. And it's just, uh, so we'll go, okay, so what is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance? Well, we'll come back to that, but that's, it's all about their definition. It says, okay, well then, so we go down and what we find is there's actually no definition in the bill. It's completely by this international organization. But what I do have so highlighted here, it is the policy of the United States to enforce such title against prohibited forms of discrimination rooted in anti-Semitism as vigorously as against all other forms of discrimination prohibited by such title. Uh, I'll read some other things. Just to summarize, the bill itself has no definition of anti-Semitism, and it's just saying it's an extension of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There are some other things that are written in there. Uh, surprisingly, the, uh, uh, the International uh, Holocaust Remembrance Association, the IHRA, uh, their, their definition has been adopted back as far as uh, 2015, I believe, by the United States. And we'll get to that. You know what? Let's just jump over here to who is this? So the IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, is an intergovernmental intergovern organization with 35 member countries. We were founded in 1998 to address challenges related to the Holocaust and genocide of the Roma. So we have um, an international organization that is going to define everything here. Well, let's get back to it then. In uh, continuing on in the bill, we have increase awareness and understanding. So this is... Uh, some of the purpose of it, it is critical to increase awareness and understanding of anti-Semitism, including its threat to America. Okay, is a bill needed to increase awareness of anti-Semitism? Improve safety and security for Jewish communities. <clears throat> Reverse the normalization of anti-Semitism and counter anti-Semitism discrimination, and expand communication and collaboration between communities. Okay, findings. Um, the use of alternative definitions of anti-Semitism impairs enforcement efforts by adding multiple standards and may fail to identify many of the modern manifestations of anti-Semitism. So they don't like alternative definitions, so they want to go with the definition of the IHRA working definition, okay, since 2018, and this is since, since 2018, when you look it up, since 2018, the Department of Education has used the IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism 
when investigating violations of that Title VI. The Title VI is referring to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, and then it, it says that alternative definitions they're not satisfied with. The use of alternative definitions of anti-Semitism impairs enforcement efforts by adding multiple standards and may fail to identify many of the modern manifestations of anti-Semitism. Under, understand why I think that's such a big deal when I get to the definition. But definitions here. The definitions, this is all you have in the bill about definitions. For the purpose of this act, the term definition of anti-Semitism. One, means the definition of anti-Semitism adopted on May 26, 2016 by the IHRA, of which the United States is a member, which definition has been adopted by the Department of State, and two, includes the contemporary examples of anti-Semitism identified in the IHRA definition. And uh, this last part I'll read here is this whole thing is only six pages long. You can read it uh, for yourself in full if you'd like. So rule of const construction for the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In reviewing, investigating, or deciding whether there has been a violation of the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 on the basis of race, color, or national origin, based on an individual's actual or perceived shared Jewish ancestry. Oh, look at that. Based on an individual's actual or perceived shared Jewish ancestry. So like, if one feels like a man, feels they're a, they're a woman, feels like they're a Jew, feels like they're not a Jew, whatever they feel like, whatever they perceive, that is the law. That is how we treat it. So if someone thinks they're a Jew, they must be a Jew. And uh, so perceived shared Jewish ancestry or Jewish ethnic characteristic, the Department of Education shall take into consideration the definition of anti-Semitism as part of the department's assessment of whether the practice was motivated by anti-Semitic intent. I need to read that again. The Department of Education shall take into consideration the definition of anti-Semitism. So they're going to take into consideration the IHRA definition, which we're going to look at in a moment, as part of the department's assessment. So they're going to use that as part of their assessment, not the whole assessment, of whether the practice was motivated by anti-Semitic intent. Not not whether this was a law-breaking situation, but whether it was motivated by anti-Semitic intent. They're going to be able to read the mind of the individual. And um, it, it's, it's pretty crazy when you get to uh, some of the other stuff. This alone is, is problematic, actually, now uh, reading it through it again. Um, let's get to the definition, though. I think that's where I was headed next. And uh, we should just head over there then. So let's do that. Let me jump over here to, well, at first, just a, my trail was like, okay, so who is this IHRA? I go here, I find this. The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance Working Definition of Anti-Semitism. I think I'm going to find a definition here. No, I don't. I just find a bunch of description about a definition. <laughs> but that's November 4th, 2022. U.S. Department of State, and then we keep going, and then, well, that's a screenshot for us to look at, and then, oh, yeah, I want to read two highlights from this article here um, by The Guardian, and hang on, I'm, zo I'm real zoomed in so you can see it better, but it's all blocked now, so come on, how should anti-Semitism be defined? All right, that's the title of the article. There we go. Stephen Sedley, freedom of expression is at the heart of this debate. Anti-Semitism is hostility towards Jews as Jews. This straightforward meaning is at the disposal of any institution or organization that needs it. It places no prior restrictions on the form of anti-Semitism on the form anti-Semitism may take. And then he goes on to say, what then, what, what then is the point of the demand that the Labor Party should adopt the verbose and imprecise definition promulgated 
in the name of the this organization. So uh, moving on down here, something else I highlighted, the UK government, which has adopted the working definition and the examples was warned by the Commons Home Affairs Select Committee in October 2016 that in the interest of free speech, it ought to adopt an explicit rider that is not an anti-Semitic, that is not anti-Semitic, to criticize the government of Israel or to hold the Israeli government to the same standards as other liberal democracies without additional evidence to suggest anti-Semitic intent. This was ignored. Okay, let's take a look at it now. Now we go on over to the IHRA. Yeah. Working definition of anti-Semitism. So here's what we have to say. So read the full text of the IHRA's non-legally binding. Well, yeah, yeah, unless the government makes it legally binding. But on a, alone, it's not, of course. But it's just a definition that the bill is pointing to. So it all depends on enforcement. A uh, non-legally binding working definition of anti-Semitism and learn more about this important tool with the FAQs below. Our working definitions are available in multiple links. Okay, anyway, I'll read uh, a good portion of this. But here's, we want to look at this here. Uh, I'll just start it. In the spirit of the Stockholm Declaration that states, with humanity still scared, scarred from, by anti-Semitism and xenophobia, the international community shares a solemn responsibility to fight those evils. The Committee on Anti-Semitism and Holocaust Denial called the IHRA Plenary in Budapest 2015 to adopt the following working definition of anti-Semitism. All right, on 26 May 2016, the plenary in Bucharest decided to adopt the following, if you can see it okay, uh, adopt the following non-legally binding working definition of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. We'll come back to that because it expands on it more. To guide IHRA in its work, the following examples may serve as illustrations. Because, yeah, when you see their illustration, oh, yeah, and then they, they get real into it. But th this alone, before we get into anything else, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews. That alone is, is very problematic if we're talking about just a perception, which may be expressed, well, okay, ex perceptions lead to ex expressions, certain perceptions of people or people groups lead to expressions, that is true. So it's a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Yes, that does happen. So, and if it's, if someone has a hatred toward Jews, that is anti-Semitic. That's not criminal. But it's anti-Semitic because hating someone is not criminal. If someone hates someone they work with, if someone hates someone in their life, um, it's not a crime. It's a really bad thing, but it's not a crime. Physical actions of violence are crime. And so... That needs to be said. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. Okay, so I've got an illustration in mind. I'm just deciding when to, when to use it. I'm just going to use it now. Because, no, I'm going to read you some more. Because you're like, well, what else does it say? And I, I don't know that I'm going to read it all. I'm going to read a lot of it, though. 
So to guide, we're 20 minutes in. All right. Okay, so the uh, manifestations might include the targeting of the state of Israel, conceived as a Jewish collective, uh, as a Jewish collectivity. Yes. Yes, it's a Jewish nation. It has other people groups, but it's a dominant Jewish nation primarily. So. Yes, <laughs> can't you, you can't just state the truth. However, criticism of Israel, similar to that leveled against any other country, cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. So, no criticism. Criticism of Israel, similar to that leveled against any other country. Oh, cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. Sorry, sorry. Uh, all right. Uh, that's good. They've got that line in there. That's helpful. Okay. Anti-Semitism frequently charges Jews with conspiring to harm humanity, and it is often used to blame Jews for why things go wrong. Okay. It is expressed in speech, writing, visual forms, and action and employs sinister stereotypes and negative character traits. Okay, so there's their excuse me, expression of uh, how it can manifest itself. It can come out in speech and writing, visual forms. Okay, lots of different ways it can come out. That's just kind of a description of what they see as anti-Semitism. Okay. Contemporary examples of anti-Semitism in public life. The media, schools, the workplace, and a religious and in the religious sphere could take taking into account the overall context include, but are not limited to. We've already seen the head, the the, the real one. <laughs> um, well, let's just get these in order. Calling for aiding or justifying the killing or harming of Jews in the name of a radical ideology, or an extremist view of religion. Yes, violence, genocide, terrible things. Making men, mendacious, dehumanizing, de demonizing, and stereotypical allegations about Jews as such, or the power of Jews as collective, such as, especially but not exclusively, the myth about a world Jewish conspiracy or of Jews controlling the media, economy, government, or other societal institutions. Now, this is interesting. I just have to just, because this is a free speech thing. So, you're not allowed to believe in conspiracies of Jews controlling the media, economy, government, or other societal institutions. Thought police. Aren't people allowed to believe crazy things? Aren't people allowed to believe in a flat earth? Aren't people allowed to believe in all kinds of crazy things? Isn't that kind of part of free speech? If they're not being violent and damaging people, uh, they can believe in different things. Uh, this, is a, this is thought police. You must not think these things. And... And how far does that go? Does is one not allowed to say to talk about Jews that are in powerful positions? Just is one not allowed? You know, or allowed to talk about? Probably not talk, allowed to talk about black people in powerful positions, right? Well, about white people in powerful positions. Like, are we allowed to point out like the ethnicity uh, or religion of people in different powerful positions? It's, it, you see how quickly this moves down the slippery slope? This is really, really bad. And then here, the most relevant one, of course, to the, the uh, to us, to the thumbnail, to everything here. Accusing Jews as a people of being responsible for real or imagined wrongdoing committed by a single Jewish person or group or even for acts committed by non-Jews. Okay, that's not the one. Um, I saw the highlight. I thought it was something else. But yeah, there's that. Accusing Jews as a people of being responsible for 
real or imagined wrongdoing. So even imagined wrongdoing. And so let's keep going. Denying the fact, scope, mechanisms, example, gas chambers, or intentionality of the genocide of the Jewish people at the hands of National Socialist Germany and its supporters and accomplices during World War II. So, scope. So, there are people that are Holocaust deniers or people that, that say things about, you know, things are exaggerated and whatever. So, should they all be locked up? I mean... How far do we take this? Because if it, are people allowed to have false ideas and wrong ideas, or or because once you say, well, no, you can't, you can't, you know, I mean, once you do this with speech, you do it on you, there's speech codes for everything and thought codes for everything. That's like 1984. You read the book. I'm gonna. I'm considering getting it again, reading through it. I read it many, many years ago. So, okay, accusing the Jews as a people or Israel as a state of inventing or exaggerating the Holocaust. Accusing Jewish citizens of being more loyal to Israel or to the alleged priorities of Jews worldwide than to the interests of their own nations. Okay, what if there's evidence of that? What if there's not? <laughs> what if there's not evidence of that? And it's just a false accusation. People falsely accuse people all the time and not in a in a legal matter, but just like saying to the person like, hey, what you told me is not true. But if you say that to a Jew about particular things, well, then that would be anti-Semitic. You see how this goes. Denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, example, by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor. Applying double standards by requiring of it a behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation. Using the symbols, here's the big one, using the symbols and images associated with classic anti-Semitism. Example, claims of Jews killing Jesus or blood libel to characterize Israel or Israelis. Well, I mean, we have some pretty clear things in scripture about that. It might even be uh, one of these other verses I was going to. It's, it's going to certainly be here, Matthew. Um, okay, so here with Pilate, Matthew 27, 22, Pilate said to them, then after saying, which one would you have released, Jesus or Barabbas? Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They said, Release Barabbas. And he said, What shall I do with Jesus? They, they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. That was the Jews. That was a group of people, the religious leaders, urging them on. And uh, the group of people that... the that vast majority, if not all, were Jews. So that was the Jews saying, let him be crucified. And then what do they say as well? They said, let his blood be upon us. Uh, his blood be on us and on our children. Yeah, it, after he says, so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. And we could go on and we could go on. I mean, that's 
made very clear for us. And um, that would mean that stating those truths, reading those truths, preaching those truths, handing out a tract with those truths, giving someone a book with those truths, giving someone a Bible is all anti-Semitic under this definition, which this definition is directly attached to that law. Of course, this definition was adopted in 2016 and then 2000 well it, we're gonna get to that again i think uh this was kind of weird it's kind of it's kind of like it, it sort of already has been adopted by the united states it's just i'm not even 100 percent sure what the bill is doing but it is trying to tie this to it's just trying to make it more enforceable it's just amazing that this has actually been a definition that's been there and been adopted by the u.s this whole time uh for many years but now it now it's just going to be you know more enforceable if it passes so anyway moving on here uh drawing comparisons of contemporary israeli policy to that of the nazis so no accusation of policy Obviously, you know, you read the Nazis and you're like, ooh, Nazis, yeah, don't compare them to... Well, I mean, we're talking about policy. They're saying don't criticize the policy. Draw on comparison, or don't... Comparisons. People make comparisons all the time. Uh, we, we see a lot of stuff happening that's very similar to 1938 Germany. We see a lot of things happening that's very similar to the Nazis. And so, you know... Um, <laughs> Over the over the past several years, we've been seeing that, and so there are parallels that are made, and uh, Democrats try and do that as well. Like you know, they try and make parallel, and you're like, no, you're the Nazis. But anyway, <laughs> um, we we do that. That's part of free speech, and so all right, holding Jews collectively responsible for actions of the state of Israel. Okay. What if it's a collective group that is responsible for the actions of the state of Israel? Like someone that's giving them a lot of money. Like America. Anti-Semitic acts are criminal. When they are so defined by law. For example, denial of the Holocaust. Or distribution of anti-Semitic materials in some countries. See? Distribution of anti-Semitic materials. We've walked through the definition. The definition clearly makes the Bible anti-Semitic, so a distribution of the Bible is illegal, according to this. If in its technicality it was enforced, then according to this, distributing the Bible to someone is a distribution of anti-Semitic materials. Criminal acts are anti-Semitic when the targets of attacks, whether they are people or property, such as buildings, schools, places of worship, and cemeteries, are selected because they are, or are perceived to be, to be, or are perceived to be, Jewish, or linked to Jews. Anti-Semitic discrimination is the denial to Jews of opportunities or services available to others and is illegal in many countries. We won't even spend time on that, but that's opportunity. They need opportunities for everything. Like what, what, what kind of opportunities, we, you know, employment opportunities. Um, you know, we have employment laws on the books. So, you know, that's the thing. We have so many laws about so many things. We don't need more laws. They're protected by, all the many, many discrimination laws, anti-discrimination laws that we have, and and um, and everything that we're seeing with the riots is it's rioting, it's um, <laughs> it's really treason, betrayal of the country, burning flags. I mean, there's there's so many things that these uh, 
students, paid agitators, uh, should be deported. They should be hunting down the funding, all of those things. And so we don't need something like this uh, at all because this, this goes against Christians and it really hurts everyone that's concerned about free speech. Anyone concerned about free speech should be vehemently against this. And it's only going to create more true anti-Semitism, more hatred of Jews, more, more taking it out on them. And maybe that's what they want. I don't know. It's the Republicans that brought this forth. So, you know, but uh, it's just going to inflame things more. For some of the students that are actually paying attention to this stuff. The majority of them, or a lot of them, seem like they don't even know why they're there. There's all kinds of video out there getting asked. One lady's like, why are we protesting again? What are, they, what are the institution involved in? We don't even know. Oh, okay. You know, it's like, they just know they're just supposed to be there. Well, here's some FAQs. Uh, maybe real quick. Why was the IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism developed? Uh, it said combating anti-Semitism requires international cooperation among experts, governments, and civil society. Following the example of the working definition of the Holocaust, denial and distortion. Okay, move on to the next one. Who developed the IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism? The experts. The experts did. The experts did. Uh, and they built an international consensus. So, don't question it. Trust the science. The experts decided on the definition by international consensus. That's enough said. There should be no questions about it whatsoever. What has its impact been? Hmm. Working definition of anti-Semitism has brought the issue once. Here, we'll just jump to my highlights. I'm running low. I don't want to make this too long. The working definition has helped educate and sensitize sensitive sensitive sensitize. I'm saying it right. All right. <laughs> make people more sensitive. Or administrative is have become more sensitive, sensitized. Administrations, politicians, judges. Police, teachers, media, and civil society. Yes, we've we've guilted them. It's broad. Oh, here's here's look at this AI. It's broad international implementation has allowed monitoring organizations to better track anti-Semitism across borders and has provided researchers and civil society organizations with a way better with a way to better moderate content online, including by training AI tools like YouTube algorithms. <laughs> this video is gone in a day. You know why? And if you don't see me post for two weeks, you know why that's called YouTube jail. I hope not, but, um, never, never had the YouTube jail. Um, you, you can't post anything for two weeks if you get hit. If you get if you get caught and you go to YouTube jail. All right, so who has adopted the working definition of anti-Semitism? The working definition. Okay, anyway, uh, forty-three countries listed below. You see forty-three countries, and I'll just do a scan here for you, just real. That's. A lot of countries. And you're going to see United States, 11th of December, 2019. Click on that. That brings this up here. And then so we've got combating anti-Semitism. So signed by President Donald J. Trump. I mean, that's who it would be, December or, uh, 2009. So um, there you go. And then this guy, uh, was, what did I look? Oh, oh, I kept reading down there and it was, uh, he was one of the guys heading it up, I guess. And then I looked up, well, forget that stuff. We got to play this. We got to play 
So Representative Chip Roy of Texas and his reaction to this. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Truth Transforms. Truth Transforms is a ministry of preaching for God's glory. And preaching for God's glory provides biblical preaching and teaching for life transformation to help believers grow in sanctification, discernment, and biblical wisdom to live for God's glory. The mission, the goal of this ministry is to transform hearts and transform minds through the truth of God's word. If you watch uh, this channel often, you know that you hear that often because that is an important goal and we absolutely need more of that. There are some ways to support if you ever feel led to support. If you've been blessed by this ministry at all, there are three primary ways that you can support. One is you can provide a love offering. This, of course, helps with funding the research and to provide quality content like this. It is certainly greatly appreciated. And on the website, there is a list of priorities in how I prioritize any donations that come in. You can also visit the merchandise store and you'll be able to find quality merchandise such as this, Preach the Word. Also, some of the most popular items are, uh, don't get mad at me, I just preach the Bible. And my husband's my favorite pastor. Those are definitely the top three. There's also Sermon Fuel, many other designs. You can get hoodies, t-shirts, coffee mugs, um, and hats. And then there's the devotional Bible study guide. There's information about that. There's a video that you can watch on the website. There's links below for all of this. And you can find out more at preachingforgodsglory.org forward slash donate. That's preachingforgodsglory.org forward slash donate. I hope that this channel and this ministry has been a blessing to you. Now, back to the show. Yet again, today on the floor of the House of Representatives, we had another show vote to make people feel good about themselves by passing a bill that says anti-Semitism in the title. That's what happened. And it was put on the floor by Republican leadership. And it was put on the floor by Republican leadership, despite knowing that it was pulled from going through committee. We didn't have a chance to amend it. We didn't have a chance to discuss it, to debate it. We didn't have a hearing on it. It was jammed through to take advantage of this political moment while all of these horrific things are going around the country. Republican leadership wanted to score political points so they moved through legislation without the kind of deliberation debate that is supposed to be carried out by the people in this chamber. As a result, today, a significant number of my Republican colleagues, including myself, voted no. As a result, we will be accused of, I don't know, being for anti-Semitic behavior, being accused by our uh, friends and allies of not wanting to support Israel, supporting our Jewish American colleagues and friends, constituents, fellow Americans. Nothing can be further from the truth, but that's what will happen. And it will happen because we dare to stand up and say we don't believe in thought police. We don't believe that a bill should be brought to the floor of the United States House of Representatives, having not gone through committee, that has a reference in it to international organizations, uh, definitions, literally in the statute, and then taking that international organization's definition, and then literally in the statute, representing and referencing the examples of anti-Semitic behavior. Now, I find the vast majority of the things that were listed in that to be horrific activity, most likely, if not certainly, anti-Semitic, at least in most contexts, some of them are problematic. In totality, they certainly raise First Amendment concerns. They certainly raise concerns about something that I've opposed to the best of my knowledge and ability, reading through pieces of legislation at every turn and every vote to oppose the whole notion of hate speech hate crimes, thought police, thought crimes, putting the government into your head and your motivations when you're engaged in criminal behavior. 
Criminal behavior is criminal behavior. Violating people's civil rights is violating people's civil rights. But when we want to insert the government into what you're thinking and what motivates you, you are empowering that which should never be empowered. But here's the thing. Get ah. Yeah, that's a problem. You need to know um, if your state representatives voted for or against it. I'll link this below. That's just quick where I found it. There are the Republicans that voted against it. There's Chip Roy. There's Marjorie Taylor Greene. We'll hear from her if there's time. Uh, I was disappointed to not find Jim Jordan on here because I have a clip I was going to play of him. He said a lot of good stuff, but he must have voted for it or didn't vote or something. And then, you know, lots of Democrats, like 70. What does it say? It says up here, um, 70 Democrats and 21 Republicans voted against the Anti-Semitic Awareness Act. And um, it passed with 320 votes to 91. That's really, really bad. That's really, really bad. Um, introduced? By Republicans, I, mean, I looked up. Well, who introduced this? It was introduced back in October, so you know. Uh, well, this oh well, this is March twenty six, two thousand nineteen. In light of the growing trend of anti-Semitic actions coming from across the nation and world, Senators Tim Scott and Bob Casey introduced this. Bill. Okay, so they they've been working on this in 2019. And this is an opportunity. So we must stand together, says Senator Scott. We must stand together against racism and bigotry by ensuring that justice is served against those who seek to divide us. Yeah, justice must be served. This is not justice. Uh according to the anti-defamination. Anti-Defamation League. In 2017, there were 204 reported incidents of anti-Semitic related events on campus, nearly doubled that of 108 in 2016. The surge in these acts can be attributed to the nationwide rise of anti-Semitic rhetoric and related occurrences. I think I highlighted that just for, like, I hate to see any activity but 204 reported incidents in what in the entire year okay yeah I, you know it was a lot more than the year before but it just doesn't it doesn't seem like like an incredible number or anything i, I mean i don't know what the normal stats are for things like that but it just doesn't it just didn't seem really high upon reading it um what are they saying okay so this part i must have thought was important today the federal government does not have all of the tools it needs to investigate anti-semitic incidents on campuses yet yeah, does not have all the tools to investigate anti-semitic incidents on campus as it does for most other forms of discrimination. So this is a special form, but, but uh, wow, okay, so they need more tools. At a time of rising anti-Semitic incidents, we welcome the Senate's introduction of the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, which provides important guidance for federal anti-discrimination investigations involving anti-Semitism said Jonathan Greenblatt, ADL CEO. This will help the federal government determine... It's the language again. This will help the federal government determine whether an anti-Semitic or anti-Israel incident crosses the line from protected free expression into harassing unlawful or discriminatory conduct. Now... 
what will be the deciding factor as to whether it crosses the line from protected free expression into harassing unlawful or discriminatory conduct. Eh, hands in the air, arbitrary, completely arbitrary is probably what, I mean, we do have a standard, the IHRA. If they went off of that technical standard, I think everyone would be an anti-Semite. Uh, because everyone had violated it at some point, probably. Because if you, like, say that, I don't know, hey, that basketball team there, there's like five Jews playing on that team, and the coach is Jew. They must have a strong Jewish presence in that area. Like, oh, wow, that's anti-Semitic. It's an observation. It's just an observation. Like, that now observations are anti-Semitic if they're observations about Jews. That's where this goes. Now, if two men get in a fight, let's say two kids, two boys, whatever, they get in a fight, and if I, I, I don't know, I just, I just thought about this uh, illustration earlier. It was like if you had um, a black man and a white man get in a fight. Uh, the white guy hits the black guy. And um, he could hit him for any reason. And the black guy could could claim, you know, he could pull the race card and say, that's that's why he hit me and whatever. And, and he could have, you know, trouble because of that. Uh, the white guy could, could uh, say, you know, I hate you because you're black or something. He could he could he could say it because of race. And and then yeah, maybe he just says that but he doesn't hit him. Uh the black man could, could probably try to have, you know, something be done for that, but because he didn't physically hit him and didn't physically assault, he didn't physically assault him, I think he'd, he'd probably be okay. Uh if it was with the assault, that wouldn't be good. I'd probably, you know, go down as a hate crime and he'd be all over the news. Um, and then if it was, you know, well, obviously it was a black man to the white man and he could do whatever he wants. Um, and then if it's, um, I mean, if he assaulted him and not really, but you know, he, he could say whatever he wants. Uh, and, and he could say whatever he wants and then beat down the white guy and it would not be, a hate crime or racially motivated or anything like that. It would certainly not be considered that it would just be what you would normally consider someone hitting someone, someone assaulting someone. Anyway, coming to the Jew that if it's, uh, just stick with a white guy and a Jew that it's like, you know, if he says to, uh, um, he could, he doesn't even have to say anything about, the man being a Jew, but if like, let's say he hits him and it's perceived as the fact that he assaulted him was because he's a Jew. Well, then that would be an anti-Semitic hateful attack probably rather than just a, a regular assault. I don't know. It's the example I thought of. So anyway, we'll just get uh, um, back to this here and Finish this part here. Uh, because investigations would be informed by the current widely accepted definition of anti-Semitism. So we applaud Senator Scott's and Casey's leadership in sponsoring this important legislation, which will help protect Jewish students from discrimination on campus. Well, not infringing on the free speech of all students. Yeah, that's just not true. All right. So, um... I don't know. I've got so much stuff here. You know, I, I just put, well, anti-Semitic verses of scripture. And I got this. The Gospel of John. I mean, I've got plenty of places I could go, but I was curious what I would find. And the Gospel of John has been used to justify anti-Semitism. So we should stop reading it on Good Friday. Says uh, this guy Amer of America, the Jesuit Review. And a couple of things just to, to say, he said, the Christian celebration of Holy Week brings with it increased anti-Semitic comments, threats, and violence. And it has for over a thousand years. The justification is always the same. The Jews killed Jesus. 
says a whole lot going down here. The term the Jews occurs almost 70 times in the Gospel of John. Not every instance is actively hostile. Oh, thank you for recognizing. And the passion story, for instance, Jesus describes the synagogue as a place where the Jews gather. Yeah, nothing hostile about that. But 29 times, including 11, within the 82 verses of the Passion story, we see the term used specifically for those who want to do away with Jesus and his followers. So in chapter 19, Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. All right, so there you go. Can't read the Gospel of John. Don't read it on, on, Fr on Good Friday. He provides a solution, a solution that doesn't quite work. Oh, yeah, that's right. He doesn't quite. It, he says this doesn't work. In Jesus Wasn't Killed by the Jews, a book written by a, 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 someone he works with, or a, a colleague of his, John Sweeney, the book's editor, argues that one strategy for solving the problem of using John on Good Friday would be to take a moment before the proclamation of the Passion and contextualize the account in the ways that I just did. John isn't talking about all Jewish people. The church condemns any such interpretation and also any scapegoating of Judaism. And it teaches that Jesus underwent his death freely in order that all may reach salvation. It would take three minutes, Mr. Sweeney told me in a phone interview, but only once in his life has he seen a priest attempt this. Honestly, that is more times than I have seen, and that includes the few times I have presided at Good Friday services myself. And he, oh, a better solution, use a different gospel. Why do we continue to use John's passion when we have three other choices? Mr. Sweeney wonders if it is actually because of its uh, theatricality. Maybe it lends itself to dramatic performance in a way that others don't, he said. According to John Baldwin, a sacramental, sacramental theologian, John's text is generally seen as the most triumphant. Uh, did I... I don't know. He would. I don't know if I read. I just scanned this last part, but essentially he's saying, "Don't read the Gospel of John. That's his solution." So read one of the other Gospels. Okay, there you go. That's the solution. But that's why would we not have to like? Okay, thanks, Mister Jesuit. Thanks for the advice on what we should do. Uh, here's. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene saying that she voted against the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, giving the reason why she voted against it. She said this, Anti-Semitism is wrong, but I will not be voting for the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act of 2023 today that could convict Christians of anti-Semitism for, for believing the gospel that says Jesus was handed over to Herod to be crucified by the Jews. Read the Bible text and, and she... She links to the bill here and everything. But let's watch CNN's response to this. Today she announced she was voting against a bill to combat anti-Semitism. And in her reasoning, she invoked an anti-Semitic trope. I want to read you what she said in her post on social media. She said, anti-Semitism is wrong, but I will not be voting for the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act today that could convict Christians of anti-Semitism for believing the gospel that says Jesus was handed over to Herod to be crucified by the Jews. Now, that claim that Jewish people were responsible for the death of Jesus have, has historically been used to justify anti-Semitic attacks on the Jewish community. So just another example of Green's controversial behavior and also not the first time she has used anti-Semitic rhetoric. Notice there was literally no pause, literally no pause from making that statement uh, just reading what, what Green wrote and what Scripture says to running right into, yeah, that's anti-Semitic. Of course it is. And that's been used for violence and all these things. And it's like, wow. Um, but that's what Scripture says. 
like lots of terrible things have been misused but you can't just like if you actually care about the constitution actually care about free speech actually care about religious liberty um you don't just ignore something like that so yeah this is a, this is a problem and let's not forget of course what the first amendment does say congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, it does say in the bill that uh, they're not going to... It says in there, it has some clause in there about, you know, this can't go against First Amendment rights. But obviously, like, everything in that definition goes against First Amendment rights. Like, literally everything. So, how does that work? So, that's where you get into the whole just arbitrary, completely depends on how they enforce it. And and then you get back to judges and Supreme Courts, and we just continue to have the monarchy of the Supreme Court that we've been living under for years now. That's that's actually is really what this country is. It's a it's a monarchy. The Supreme Court is king. That's pretty much how we're governed at this point. So, um, she said this also, since George Soros is Jewish and funds the radical left, including the pro Hamas protests breaking out on college campuses, thanks to Mike Lawler's new anti-Semitism bill, College kids who speak out against Soros could be convicted of anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic, of being anti-Semitic. Talk about opening Pandora's box. It it absolutely does. Uh, Joe Biden is anti-Semitic because he didn't speak out against, you know, he's trying to walk the line in this whole thing. And he was even interrupted in a in a protest. Um, and, and, uh, they're very angry at him. Uh, both sides are, are angry at him. Those that are for Israel be having the right to exist and those that want Israel exterminated. They're both mad at him. The law. I look forward to working to get this across. Hey everyone. Hey everyone. It's Congressman Mike Lawler. I just want to say how proud I am that my bill, the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, just passed the House of Representatives, 320 votes to 91. This bill has broad bipartisan support and will begin the process of cracking down on the anti-Semitism that we've seen run rampant on college campuses all across America. This is a big day and a big win. Now we got to get it through the Senate and signed into law. I look forward to working to get this across the finish line. Hey, everyone, it's Congressman Mike Law. Messed up. Like, what we're seeing across college campuses is lawlessness. Pure lawlessness. Anarchy. And Biden was asked uh, about sending in the National Guard. He said, no. Uh, wait, she's got a clip of that, too. <laughs> um, I saw his short speech. And um, uh, have the protests forced you to reconsider the policies? Biden answers that, uh, and then he answers the question about if the National Guard should be sent in. And Taylor says, or Taylor Green says, Biden wants a civil war to start on college campuses and spill out all over America. Here's this. President, have the protests forced you to reconsider any of the policies with regard to the region? No. Thank Mr. You. President, do you think the National Guard should intervene? No. 
Mr. President, the former president said that he was no longer. So that was after his like three, four minute address to America about, you know, the violence on the campuses is, is bad. That's like what we heard from him. And, you know, so everything's anti-Semitic, I guess, uh, including these verses here of, um, I had some other ones queued up here, but you get the point. But I mean, especially, I mean, we've got uh, Romans 11, where we've got, you know, in there that all Israel will be saved, that, that, that you know, we have that being a part of the, the Jews still being a part of God's plan, but we also have earlier on in the chapter, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. These are very truthful things that we have in scripture. And we have Republican leaders and all leaders voting to say, you're not even allowed to say these things. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So we've got an awful lot in scripture that is uh, very much could become illegal. Well, uh, I wanted to show you some of Jim Jordan's thoughts here. This shows that we do not need a new law to just enforce some of the laws that we have in place. Of course, laws against rioting, laws against uh, terrorism, laws against uh, their immigration policies, and many uh, students there and paid agitators that are there on visas and could definitely need to be, we should say, not that they will with this administration, but uh, they really need deported. Here's uh, Jim Jordan being interviewed by Chris Cuomo, former CNN guy. All right, let's start this. I played the wrong one first. All right, here's Jim Jordan talking about the concern of who's funding these protests and the need for mass deportation. What is the meat on the bones of concerns about the money? I think everything you just described, and where's this money coming from? You see all these tents and this kind of organized fashion this is done. Who's financing it? We think that's an important question. And from the Judiciary Committee perspective, we think, as I said today in this press event, there are three sort of fundamental questions the Biden administration should answer. First, are these students who are engaged in this radical activity, what the law says espousing or promoting, endorsing terrorist activity, are these students engaged in that? Are they here on a visa? If we know who they are, is the State Department actively trying to revoke that visa? And for those who've had their visa revoked, is the Department of Homeland Security starting removal process, getting them out of the country? Because if you're engaged in that kind of activity, radical activity, not First Amendment protected speech, but radical activity that's against the law, you're not supposed to be here. That's plain and simple. So that's what we're going to look at from the perspective of the Judiciary Committee, which has kind of jurisdiction over immigration law. All right, there you go. You heard him. Uh, immigration law. They had a, a graphic on the screen. Let's look at what they threw up there. It is Immigration and Nationality Act. Any alien who endorses or espouses terrorist activity or persuades others to endorse or espouse terrorist activity or support a terrorist organization is ineligible to receive a visa and ineligible to be admitted to the United States. So there is a law very clearly that can be used. Um, we do not need some new law in place of an anti-Semitism awareness act. How about let's get an anti-Christian awareness act and stop 
making it impossible for Christians to live in this country. All right, we'll continue on with the second part of this clip where Jim Jordan is talking about uh, the mass amount of students that are here on visas and uh, population numbers. Those fundamental questions are questions the American people have. And frankly, we as members of Congress and the American people would like to know the answers to those fundamental questions. Remember, on September 30th, 2021, uh, my, Secretary Mayorkas writes a memorandum on how he's going to enforce immigration policy. And he talks about it in that memorandum, what you're looking for. And he says, if there's a national threat, a threat to national security, then you're so, that's, that's, that's basis for removal. Well, the sort of the, the overarching question is, is what's going on in these campuses, is that a national security threat? It sure looks like it when it's being done primarily, or at least we think in part by, um, students here on a visa. Remember, at, at Columbia, 55% of the student body is here on a visa. So a majority of the people there as students are on a visa. Now, maybe there's people coming in, engaged in this activity who aren't even students. We don't know. And that'll, I think the financing figure in that all out will help us determine that. But if there's students who are engaged in this radical activity that's against the law and they're here on a visa, they're supposed to be removed. I had no idea that that high a percentage, I don't even know that that's right, that it's 55%, uh, but that certainly provides context. Thir Why not use 30 this, 30 Mr. Chair? At, Go ahead. I was just going to say 30% at Harvard, 58% at Northeastern, and 42% at NYU. It's a huge number. And, that, and that's mm. not just Northeastern schools. That, those numbers are pretty high in other schools, not as typically as high in Midwestern state universities, right. but it's a significant number of people, of uh, uh, students who are here on some kind of visa. Uh, Mr. Chairman, why not use this uh, situation as an opportunity to put together legislation uh, about immigration and the southern border uh, right now and take action and show the American people uh, that something can get done to make these things better instead of just holding it off until after the election? Well, we've tried. I mean, we tried that. We passed it a year ago. A bulk of that legislation, uh, House Bill 2, came through our committee, the Judiciary Committee, and then the other part of it came through Homeland Security Committee here in Congress. We passed that out of the House. It's been sitting in the Senate for now a year, but Chuck Schumer won't bring it up. So we're for doing something, but it seems to me that the Biden administration isn't. Again, they willfully, deliberately, intentionally created the problem on day one when they reversed the policies that the, that the Trump administration had in place, frankly, policies that were working, they reversed those, they made that intentional decision to do so on day one, and they've given us this, this mess, which by the way, Chris, we're on track to get to 12 million migrants coming in the country in the Biden administration. That's equivalent, that number, 12 million, is equivalent to the entire population of our home state, the state of Ohio, and we're the seventh largest state in the country. That's the magnitude of this problem. So they don't want to address it, for some reason, they want this to continue for, I, I have no idea why, but they do. So that's the problem. We passed legislation a year ago that would fix the problem. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a serious problem. We've got a lot of problems on our hands and we don't need new bills that are attacking free speech. Well, we need to remember uh, that uh, persecution is coming and, and we know that persecution is coming and going to be ramped up more and more. So we need to trust the Lord. We need to stay close to him. Uh, we need to preach the good news of Jesus Christ uh, to save sinners from hell. And uh, we need to pray that this bill does not pass. Uh, write your senators, write your representatives, and uh, let them know that you don't want uh, this to pass, that this is... This is very bad for Christians. This is very bad, really, for free speech in general for anyone. And they need to hear from you, and that would be a good thing to do. And uh, so pray and write. Thanks for watching Truth Transforms. My name is Adam Markley. The goal of Truth Transforms is to transform hearts and transform minds through the truth of God's word. If you're new here, go ahead, and hit, go ahead and hit subscribe. Hit that like button. Let's help us reach more people. God bless you, and I will see you in the next video.